So good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our May Coast to Coast meeting. Thanks for joining us today. Before we get started, just a reminder that mics will be muted during our presentation, um, but please feel free to send any questions that may come up via the chat um, if anything comes up during Dr. Wallace's presentation. A couple of quick reminders. As always, our support groups are confidential and any personal information that's shared here today should not be shared outside of this group. The first portion of this meeting will be recorded to share with others who weren't able to make it today, um, but the recording will be shut off following the presentation to encourage free and open discussion and to protect the, partic er, sorry, protect the privacy of all participants. Um, another reminder that the facilitators, moderators, and participants of this group do not provide medical advice. For example, it's okay for a participant to speak about their experiences with a specific treatment, but a participant should not be recommending or suggesting a treatment, medication, or a medical procedure to another participant. Um, and as always, the opinions and information that are shared at these meetings do not replace the advice of a medical professional. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so following the presentation portion of the meeting, there'll be time for a Q&A period. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand using the raise your hand function on Zoom, which can be found either under reactions or participants on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of the screen, depending on what device you're joining us on today. When you press the raise your hand function, we will see that you have a question and call on you to unmute yourself to ask your question. You could also use the chat. Depending on how long the Q&A runs, we should have time for our usual support group meeting and sharing sessions in the breakout room you choose when you registered for the meeting. I will now be introducing Dr. Wallace. Christopher J.D. Wallace is a urolo urologic oncologist at the University of Toronto and Mount Sinai Hospital slash University Health Network. He obtained his Doctor of Medicine from the University of British Columbia and his Doctor of Philosophy in Clinical Epidemiology and Healthcare Research from the Institute of Health Policy, Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. He completed his clinical residency in urology at the University of Toronto Affiliated Hospitals and his Society of Urologic Oncology accredited fellowship training at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. His research focuses on leveraging a variety of epidemiologic techniques to understand the interaction between processes of care and patient outcomes, with a particular focus on patients with cancer and those undergoing surgery. Recently, his work has focused heavily on understanding the interplay between physician characteristics and patients' operative outcomes. Without further ado, I will now leave the floor to Dr. Wallace. Just making sure you can hear me. Um, it's real, perfect. It's my so honor and pr uh, privilege to talk to you guys. Um, this is, you know, in large part work that formed the basis of uh, some of my research during fellowship, and it's uh, been work I've been happy to share with other physicians and um, as well as also other patient groups. And so, um, I think. You know, I take a fairly wide view of prostate cancer and how we approach prostate cancer and prostate cancer treatment. And I think it's easy to get caught in the nitty gritty of, um, you know, complications or incontinence rates or things like that. But I think um, my perspective, at least, is that uh, we really want to take a, a wider perspective. And what, what I try and do when I'm seeing patients in my clinic is as we go through the prostate cancer journey from diagnosis through treatment and the whole survivorship process is you want patients to feel good about their choices. You want patients to make choices that they, um, you know, looking back, feel like they made the right choice and they're happy with their decision-making. And so the converse of course of that is regret is to sit back, um, be in the future and look back and, and think, you know, maybe I should have made a different choice or I wish I'd done something differently. And when we, you know, do everything possible to cut that down, I think that's that's really where we're improving the quality of care we deliver. And so this um, is my standard uh, disclosure slide I give. This essentially says that I've been paid um, some money from a bunch of companies and uh, groups to provide uh, thoughts and expertise on how to design studies for the most part. So because of my PhD work, I've got some expertise in designing uh, clinical trials and other studies. And so uh, a number of groups have asked me to sort of help them design studies uh, looking at prostate and kidney cancers. Now, I think we want to 
as I was alluding to before, take a step back and think about what is the goal of prostate cancer treatment? Is it to live longer? Is it to cure prostate cancer uh, in isolation? Um, uh, many of you guys will know um, Mark Emberton and Hash Ahmed. They're urologists who practice at the University College of London in the UK and have really been forward thinkers in the area of focal therapy for prostate cancer. But I think one of their most interesting studies is this um, compare study where they asked men to trade off risks and benefits of treatment. And one of the striking things that came away for me, and it may not be a surprise for you, um, but I think it, it probably is for most physicians, is that patients with prostate cancer are willing to compromise their survival, how long they live, in order to protect or achieve a better quality of life. And so maybe we can think of this um, in sort of research speak as looking at quality of life or, or quality adjusted life years, which is a way of uh, quantifying um, both the duration of life and its quality. And so I think we need to think a bit more broadly about what outcomes matter in prostate cancer. And clearly we know that there's lots of research that's been done and I've published a bunch of it looking at various outcomes of prostate cancer treatments. And we know that the side effects of treatments differ between surgery, radiation, and surveillance approaches. Um, or, you know, erectile dysfunction, urinary incontinence are the most commonly cited, uh, particularly for patients undergoing prostate surgery. But what's really interesting in this, highlighted in this table here from one of my mentors, Dr. Penson, is that the correlation between symptoms, whether you're having leakage, or having um, erectile dysfunction and how much it bothers you is not perfect. So many patients who, uh, who have particularly erectile dysfunction after prostate cancer surgery, depending on their life circumstances and the relationship with their partner, um, it may not actually cause that much bother or impairment in their day-to-day uh, -day quality of life, despite the fact that there is that symptomatic uh, um, issue. And this complicates treatment counseling because every man um, has a different uh, relationship between their symptoms and how much it impacts them. Um, and so we know that patient-centered care can improve outcomes and not just the quote-unquote soft outcomes, um, which obviously are very important, but even real important uh, uh, quantifiable um, hard disease-specific outcomes. And so when I look at um, patient-centered care, this is a slide from one of my friends, uh, Alicia Morgans. Um, this really involves uh, an interplay between the physician, the health system, and the patient and their family to come uh, through a process of, of communication and decision-making um, together. And when we look at quality of life, again, highlighted in the slide here from Alicia, we, we focus a lot in prostate cancer on these patient-reported outcome metrics or PROMs, um, and we can quantify uh, adverse events or, or side effects of treatment, but there's all there's this whole other X factor that is hard to quantify and doesn't uh, you know doesn't get well represented in the literature that really uh, contributes importantly to quality of life. And so when we try and integrate all of this together, then we get the quality of life that's associated with um, a disease and its treatment. And so um, the converse of high quality of life. Uh, that's really treatment decision driven is treatment regret. And so regret, when you consider it, is really a cognitive emotion. It's a thinking more than a feeling kind of emotion. And it's premised on this, what we call a counterfactual comparison. And so to feel regret, it can't just be about what you've experienced. You have to be comparing it to something else. You have to have an alternative that you can consider as a realistic possibility. And you consider you, you generally experience regret when your experience uh, based on the choice you made isn't as good as what you would manage it, imagined the alternative could be or what the outcomes of your our choice uh, were um, when you envisioned them. And what's nice in the context of prostate cancer treatment is it's a really integrative outcome that brings together all sorts of different uh, uh, factors associated with the diagnosis and treatment, including you know, the, the functional impairments, some oncologic cancer-related outcomes and anxiety, the behavioral, emotional, and interpersonal changes that come with the diagnosis and treatment. And then it frames these in the context of a patient's values and expectations. So for someone who 
isn't worried about erectile function, the symptoms are given less weight when you consider regret. And so that really creates a, a personalized and patient-centered way of assessing these outcomes. And so this uh, concept is something I've been sort of ruminating on for a while and formed the basis of this paper we published in JAMA Oncology this past fall. It's really a culmination of a number of studies together in one. And we, we tried to look at three different questions. One was looking at the degree to which um, the treatment you choose predicts your likelihood of having regret, how the outcomes, functional outcomes like erectile function, urinary function and bowel function may affect those things. And then looking at how we can potentially identify patients before they undergo their treatment uh, who are more likely to have regret so that we can uh, intervene before they, they head down the treatment pathway. And to do this, we looked at a, a cohort of patients called the CSER cohort. This is a prospective population-based cohort. So we identified men in five different areas in the US who are newly diagnosed with prostate cancer. And we approached them to answer surveys about their um, symptoms and experiences starting right at the time of diagnosis through to many years after treatment. And in this study, we focus really on patients with localized prostate cancer, um, uh, age 80 and less. And our outcome here, while in other studies with the CSER cohort, we've looked at things like incontinence and erectile dysfunction and bowel function and a whole bunch of other things. In this study, we really focused on regret as the outcome and uh, um, a PhD psychologist named Jack Clark has, has put in some really good work uh, coming up with ways that we can define this and quantify it. And, and we use that and we ask patients about their regret three and five years after their treatment. And this is a, a diagram that shows how we think about regret. And I'll walk through this uh, a little bit slowly, but we take the patient characteristics when they're starting at the time of their diagnosis, so their age, their education, race and ethnicity, their marital status, their comorbidity, and those all feed into their expectations about prostate cancer treatments. This interacts with their participatory decision-making style, i.e. how they interact with their physicians and how they go about making decisions. Is it someone who looks for guidance from the physician more, someone who drives their decisions more independently? And then obviously their tumor characteristics and how aggressive the cancer is, all these things play into the choice of treatment you make. And the choice of treatment uh, affects your outcomes. You know, patients who have surgery are more likely to have uh, urine leakage than if they had radiation. Patients who have radiation are more likely to have bowel problems. And these things all together can contribute uh, to treatment-related regret. And so we built a, a number of statistical models to try and account for all the differences that patients may have uh, while really trying to isolate the effect of, of the things that we're most interested in on regret. And so what you'll see here is that we uh, examined just over 2,000 men, about 1,100 who had surgery, about 660 who had radiation, about uh, just over 250 who had surveillance. And overall, 13% of men, so that's ballpark one in eight, uh, experience clinically significant regret after their treatment. Uh, and we see that it's a little bit higher for those who had surgery at 16%, a little bit lower for those who had radiation at seven, or sorry, radiation at 11 and surveillance at 7%. But then we start looking at our first question, which is, does the treatment you, you choose uh, predict your chance of having regret after we account for the fact that there are differences between patients, there's differences in age, there's differences in their disease characteristics, and so what you'll see is that overall, patients who had active treatment, whether it's surgery or radiation compared to surveillance, were more likely to have regret. So those regret, uh, those surveillance patients uh, appear to be uh, doing better. And this is particularly noted when we look at the low risk group and the intermediate risk group, probably because these patients in the three and five year timeframes that we're looking at are pretty unlikely to have significant worsening of their cancer um, if they don't opt for treatment. Conversely, in the high-risk group, patients who had surgery and radiation are less likely to have regret, and those who had surveillance are more likely to have regret. And this is because this higher-risk subset is more likely to have disease progressing, I think, and so they're more likely to feel like they may have missed the opportunity for treatment um, uh, by having an initial or true opportunity for, for treatment with curative intent, at least, um, by missing that, that early window. And what's interesting when we look at comparisons between surgery and radiation, the two different active approaches, 
there's a, a suggestion that patients who have surgery are somewhat more likely to have regret, although that's only really significant and meaningful in those who have a high risk disease. So the next question is, what about everything else? Treatment modality maybe matters, but what about all the other things? So this is looking at predictors. So patients who have worse sexual function after their treatment are more likely to have regret. We talked about the treatment modality before. We also know that if you're more engaged with the decision-making style, so if your participating decision-making score shows that you're you know, uh, uh, taking a greater say and the, the physician is leading a little bit less, you're less likely to have regret. Um, additionally, we see here that the real uh, effect appears to be about perceptions. And so patients who felt like looking backwards at, at five years, that the outcomes were much worse than they thought they would be, um, are much, much more likely to have regret. And so let's put this a different way. If the overall chance of having regret is 13% or one in eight, if you thought the treatment was much less effective than you than you had uh, anticipated, your chance of having regret is over 70%. Uh, conversely, if your treatment side effects were much worse than you anticipated, then the chance of having regret is nearly 50%. So clearly it's about uh, regret is driven by a disconnect between your expectations before you start treatment and what actually happens. And the patients who, who have outcomes that are much, much worse in terms of effectiveness or toxicity than they thought are the ones who are gonna have much higher regret. And that's actually um, somewhat promising, actually somewhat encouraging. We'll talk about why that is. Now, we look for other baseline characteristics thinking maybe we can identify a phenotype of patients who's most likely to have regret before they even start their treatment. And if we can identify those people, maybe we can target some interventions to really uh, help them uh, and reduce that chance of long-term regret. So again, participate decision-making score is important here. Age of diagnosis was important here. So this means that younger men are more likely to experience regret, older men less likely. Uh, social supports are important. So better social supports decrease your chance of regret. Um, and the interesting thing when we look moving forward is that regret doesn't change a lot over time. If you have regret at three years, you're likely to still keep having it at five. And so this is something that we're thinking can, uh, this suggests that intervening early is likely to have a, a prolonged effect and a prolonged benefit. And so this is, you know, my talk's sort of split in two. This is the first half of the talk. And really what we see here is that, uh, Regret is a bit more common than I think most physicians appreciate. We're talking about clinically significant regret, such that when I've talked to other patient groups, uh, you know, I've spoken with men who describe uh, suicidality as a result of their prostate cancer treatments and, and their perception of how things are going. And what's important to understand for us is that the the treatment you choose does appear to have an effect on your likelihood of regret, and particularly among men for low and intermediate risk disease. When we actively treat with surgery or radiation, that really increases the regret compared to uh, surveillance, whereas the converse is true in higher risk disease. And we need to understand that this disconnect between expectations and outcomes contributes to regret more than any other factor we can identify. And so work to bridge that gap between expectations and outcomes is going to be the key. And that actually means that this is potentially much more modifiable than, you know, changing our surgical technique to try and improve the urinary continence, which is important, but probably much less likely to have an impact than changing the way we counsel patients and making sure that realistic expectations are, are established from the beginning. And so this, um, I think, is actually a really promising um, uh, conclusion because it really gives us a window of opportunity to how we may intervene. And so I want to leverage one potential tool we may have um, that, that may help with regret. And so that's time. And we need to think for a minute, why do patients wait for surgery? And I know, you know we have patients all across the country on this call. Um, and there's various wait times. I know, you know some aspects of the country and some areas have uh, particularly notable uh, wait times currently. Um, but you know, COVID has certainly made that worse. Health system delays are, I think, a reality in Canada. But maybe we should think about delays 
therapeutically and, and doing this because we can and we want to. And so this is um, work that uh, uh, a resident that I'm mentoring uh, did back when he was a, a med student uh, in Boston. This is a systematic review. And I wanna just take a minute to highlight what a systematic review is. This is uh, a very objective and structured way of looking at all the studies that have been published uh, to date on a question and combining the information from all the available literature to come up with a, um, an overall uh, guidance. And so this is a little bit different than you may have heard the term meta-analysis. And that's a little different because that's a quantitative way of mathematically combining studies. So what's important here to see is that uh, there's 24 studies that address this question at the time that these, uh, these guys did their study. Uh, and while there's been a whole flurry of interest in and around COVID relating to treatment delays, this, this goes back to 2004, actually the first study. So what they found is that there was no association between treatment delays and worse survival outcomes. And treatment delays of at least three months are safe and evidence of any worse outcomes with even longer delays up to a year are pretty inconsistent and not reliable. So, so time is on our side in prostate cancer. And that's something that I think is important for everyone to remember. Uh, I certainly try and counsel my patients who have localized prostate cancer that you know, treatment decisions don't need to be made in a rush. We do have time on our side. However, this study didn't really address longer term outcomes. They looked at biochemical recurrence, the PSA coming back after surgery, um, but very few looked at survival outcomes. So we wanted to look at this because we know that in low risk prostate cancer, the preferred way of treating it is with waiting. Active surveillance, watching low risk prostate cancer is the preferred approach. And so we know it's safe in low risk disease. Um, and this is based on data. So one of my mentors in residency, uh, Laurie Klotz, published this sort of seminal work showing that there are low rates of progression to metastasis or death from prostate cancer, even after 15 years of watching patients. And so the question really is, what about those with higher risk? And you can see in these curves, this is biochemical recurrence as the outcome, which I, I don't think is the greatest outcome here, but it gives you a clue that you see in low risk, there's no real uh, evidence of a change in the risk of, of biochemical recurrence if you have delays. And intermediate risk is basically the same. But in high risk, we start seeing some inflection. And in this study, it's around 18 months, actually. So we want to look at this in a bit more detail. And so one of the medical students working with me sought to take a, undertake this project. And this is using data from the search database, uh, which is in the US, but it's a geographically and racially diverse cohort of patients who've treated with prostatectomy. Um, and we focused on those who had intermediate and high risk disease. That's about 4,000 patients we had in our study. We looked at the effect of treatment delays between the di uh, diagnosis on biopsy and their, their prostatectomy. And so what you can see here, and I'm not trying to get you to be a statistician, but there's three lines. And the key here is that the lines overlap. You can't really tell that they're there. So whether your surgery is within the first three months after your biopsy, it's between three and six months after, or it's more than six months out to a year after your biopsy, it doesn't change your chance of the, the prostate cancer you know, spreading or, or of dying of prostate cancer. So that is reassuring information. Others have found similar things. So this is um, Johns Hopkins. This is a single center of excellence. Over 2,000 men delays up to six months, including very high risk disease. No difference in pathological outcomes like surgical margins, lymph node spread. No difference in the need for adjuvant radiation. No difference in biochemical recurrence. No difference in metastasis. If you look at the National Cancer Database in the US. This is nearly 130,000 men. Again, it's safe to wait. And so I think when we put this in context, we know that it's safe to wait for localized prostate cancer. Why might we want to wait? This additional time can facilitate decision-making. And I think it really can be beneficial to take the time and really you know, get multiple opinions, talk to friends and colleagues who've um, been through it, reach out and engage with support groups like your own, um, and really come to the most informed decision possible. And so um, 
this fits into the way I have viewed uh, medical decision making. We used to have paternalistic, then we switched to this idea of informed decision making where it's a bit unidirectional and the clinician just provides information and leaves the patient to make sense of it. And I think the best is, and, and how I practice is shared decision making where it's a bit of an iterative process where the physician provides information and then based on the, the patient's values and preferences and questions, we sort of iteratively work towards a solution that most fits the patient's um, preferences and, and priorities. And so uh, this is gonna wrap up the, uh, um, you know, the portion of, of my talk um, that's didactic and then I'm happy to sort of talk and, and discuss your thoughts on this and maybe answer some questions. But um, what we've seen is that treatment related regret is much more common in patients with low-quality prostate cancer than I think most have appreciated. And what's interesting is that over time, when we look back to studies from the 90s, we haven't really made substantial progress. The, the rates of regret are about the same. And that's despite the fact that um, our outcomes are better, but that highlights why we think the underlying mechanism of regret is, is because the expectations have changed. Despite the fact that, you know, an open radical prostatectomy in the 90s had a very high rate of blood transfusion, and we used to preemptively get patients to donate their own blood so we could give it back to them. Uh, and now, you know, I haven't, I can't recall the last time I uh, uh, transfused a patient. Um, while our outcomes have improved, the expectations have as well. And so regret is actually not improving um, at all uh, over time. And, and that's really driven by this disconnect between uh, expectations and outcomes. Notably, uh, particularly in those patients with low risk disease, active treatment, surgery or radiation is associated with an increased chance of having regret. And those of us who treat prostate cancer and operate on patients for prostate cancer I think need to bear this in mind every time we go through the consent process. And because treatment delays don't appear to harm oncologic outcomes, we can leverage that fact to allow patients all the time in the world they need to come up with a, uh, a treatment decision that most reflects their values and their priorities after getting um, you know, consultation with as many people as, as they need to come to that uh, decision. And so that's um, the end of my slides. I uh, would be very happy to uh, chat with you guys, um, answer any questions, and um, you know provide any information I can.